that portrait uh, uh, is is now uh, uh, at, at the at at the bars gallery in um, in William Street. So we can bring that down. Thanks, Bruce. Well, that the uh, previous so Julian, photo. But, um, obviously, I mean, he's developed into quite an artist, and I assume yeah. that's a skill that he got whilst he was whilst he was in prison. Yeah, no skill before that. So they're in prison for ten years, from arrest to execution. Uh, first few years, standard story: we'll fight this, we're going to beat it, et cetera, et cetera. Then they gradually realised that they were going to be executed. That, that was seven years before they died. And they, they were both, again, from good families and they had a lot of formation to fall back on that they had grown up with. And so in about 2008, um, I remember having some very hard talks with them and basically along the lines of, well, you're probably going to die here. You might not, you might be lucky. You're in a prison that is hopelessly overcrowded and impoverished. You know, it's like a thousand prisoners when there should be three or 400. Um, you have gotta make choices. You're gonna live a, a life that you're proud of or a life that brings shame on you and your family. You're gonna be involved in drugs in prison or you're not. You're gonna be stupid little criminals or live like men, et cetera, et cetera. And I wasn't the only one interested in their welfare in that way, of course, but they, they did make a very big decision around 2008 to try to live good lives. And so they persuaded the governor of the prison to give them access to a room, which was um, more than a shed, a kind of a building in the back corner of the prison. The, the prisons are tough, you know, they're run by gangs. The underbelly of Bali like the underbelly of any big tourist place has a lot of violence and drugs and so on. The prison is where it all comes together. Um, and the boys completely stayed away from that side of the life. They got, and then a, a whole bunch of barristers in my chambers um, put together some money and we brought them about, um, I think nine or 10 computers. And we sent them to the prison and the prison, um, deactivated the internet capacity so they could only be used like a typewriter really and they set up a computer room and started teaching English and things to prisoners and most of those prisoners were from lives of poverty um, I used to say you, you could see the poverty on their faces you know when you have generational poverty the body reveals that often enough and the boys just gradually, then they started an art room and uh, a few other rooms and they were running a TAFE at the back of the prison. And the guards were, they loved it, you know. Um, they gave the keys to Myra and Sukumara and he had keys to the prison, quite literally. He could lock it all up at night and during the day they'd run classes. And then we got people, um, ordinary people who might be teachers in philosophy or art or English language to come in and start running classes for the prisoners. So for many years, we ran a TAFE at the back of the prison and it got so good that prisoners would leave prison, they might be doing a three or five year penalty and then come back in once a week to go to their classes, come back into the prison because for many of them, it's the only real good education they ever had. And in that mix, um, one, of our, one of our team, uh, we had many volunteers knocking at our door. One of them a woman called Mary Farrow, who's very involved out in the Dandenongs in community works. She got in touch with uh, an Australian painter called Ben Quilty, um, who's one of Australia's most eminent painters. Uh, ben and I are mates and Ben is a, um, Ben grew up pretty wild, again, from a, a good family, but definitely a wild, wild boy. And uh, he would have known very well that there, but for the grace of God, it could have been him sitting in a prison somewhere in the world. And, um, He's a great bloke now, but he, he'd be the first to tell you that he was, uh, he was all trouble when he was a young kid. Anyway, he started to fly up um, with another painter, an artist called Matt Sleaf, um, who lives in Melbourne. Um, and they used to go into the prison and teach painting. And um, my run took to this like a fish to water and Ben Quilty tutored my run over a few years quite a lot. And Myron became a very good painter. 
and then he would sell the paintings and the money would be coming into the prison. They'd spend it on uh, all kinds of things, equipment for the, these rooms that they were running, the tapes. So it was a self-funded education centre, became largely funded through Myron's paintings. And um, it was a, the whole scene was a great scene. And as you can imagine, when we we're lobbying the president for clemency, we thought it would carry a lot of weight and ultimately it did not. Um, and that picture you showed before with me uh, and, and, and um, my colleague, um, Veronica Hakau, holding the paintings, uh, that was coming out of the prison where he got executed or the island where he got executed. In the last three days, uh, he did about 20 paintings and we just, um, you know, prisons are very strict in some ways. The prisons where they execute in Indonesia down at Nusa Kambangan Island are very strict. But strangely enough, in the last few days, a whole new group of people came in to run the prison and they were some other bureau, let's say switching from say the equivalent of Victorian police to federal police or something like that. But we had been to that prison many times, so we knew the ins and outs, and the new guard, the new people did not. So we just announced that we were carrying out the paintings, and nobody knew whether we should or shouldn't be allowed to. And that picture you saw with us holding the paintings, there were probably 150 or more journalists on the other side of that picture. It was a huge world press frenzy, and those paintings were turning up on the front page of the newspapers all over the world. It was a large juice effort, but, you know, the decision had been made. Because Indonesia does actually not execute very many people. And um, we just carried out the paintings over the last three days of Myron's life. He would paint them all night and we would carry them out the next morning wet. And if you look carefully, we're holding them. And for years I had um, work shoes and things with um, coloured flecks of paint just dripping onto my bloody clothes. And that's where you got an award from the Law Council of Australia. I mean, one of the many awards that you've got, of course, one being the uh, AC. Uh, Julian, we've got to uh, wind it up. And it just, it's just been an unbelievable experience to hear you talk about this. But can we finish up by what goes through, what, what sort of toll does it have on you? How do you handle I mean, you're a human being. You're a barrister. Do you reckon that you're drifts into the personal question there, Joe? You're, 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 you're a human. You're a human being. How how do you handle these situations? Uh, uh, well, it, it knocks you around. Everyone involved gets knocked around pretty badly. After the <coughs> Singapore, after the uh, Indonesian execution, I had a team of uh, about eight lawyers, and you would actually know, I think, all of them: um, Megan Tittensaw, Peter Morrissey, Scott Johns. Um, Tony Trude, they'd all be names that you yep. know. Yep. Um, um, we were all uh, shattered. I actually spent a couple of months in my garden after that. I was pretty knocked out. I was actually exhausted. I mean, a number of us, Mick O'Connell, yep. um, a number of us have been working, I mean, you say around the clock, but honestly not much less than around the clock for months, you know, because we had so many things happening. We ran, in those last few months, we ran probably about four court cases in the courts, in the administrative courts, in the constitutional court. Um, in Australia, we were organising or involved in large-scale mass events. We're briefing politicians all the time, in briefing foreign officials all the time. We had the international media to deal with. Um, you know, on a busy day, you might do 20 interviews. Um, then you had the Indonesian side of things and the managing the families. It was a constant, you know, it was exhausting. And so we were all very knocked around at the end of it. And uh, I'll share something which is um, always amuses me to find out later. So I'm in the garden in my house. I had a fairly rough old back garden in those days. And we had a chook shed, quite a few chooks. And I found myself with no planning, spending a lot of time with my chooks. And um, I have uh, a couple of huskies and a lot of chooks and I'm out in the back garden. I'm not much of a gardener, but I just, in retrospect, I realised I was physically exhausted, quite apart from emotionally or mentally completely buggered, but I was physically exhausted. So I'm just slowly recuperating. 
And then I found out years later that um, for people who, I, I did not have PTSD, uh, but I had, um, I, I was um, fairly knocked around, you know, but I found out later that for people who do have PTSD, like soldiers coming back from combat and so on, uh, one of the therapies that they now use is to put them with chooks and uh, to get them to look after uh, chook yards because for whatever reason, the way the chooks move around and you kind of follow them about and they, they're meaningless darting around and so on, turns out to be good for uh, people who are mentally exhausted.